you've actually made my day because I did say to Tim, it wouldn't have been wonderful if you could give a presentation to a room that was full of love. So thank you for that uh, little moment of love before it's, uh, it's really made, uh, made my day. I am a scientist and more importantly, I work with some of the most extraordinary and talented scientists uh, that we have in this country and, uh, and globally at CSIRO and the specialists that work, uh, work alongside them. One of the one day I had a couple of uh, people come into uh, to my office, um, Stefan Halkowitz, and he said to me, "Look, I'm working on this fantastic problem." He was in our maths and information scientists area. He was working with Centrelink on trying to personalise the services that Centrelink give around this country. They're the largest provider of services in this country. He said, "But it's not big enough for me. I, I really want something more." I said to him. How about you tell us what the future is going to look like in 2050? He said, that wasn't what I expected you to say. And he left my office um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then actually went away and did that. So uh, scratched his head. He worked with James Moody. Um, and, uh, and they said, you know, we do work with 2,000 companies. We work, uh, we work in 97 countries around the world. And our partners work with us for one thing. They work with us to think about, to design, to create the future. And uh, we thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could actually tap into that, if we could listen to what our own people were working on, if we could actually get a look at what were the big things that would affect us, the things that would affect um, society, uh, economies, if the way we would live and our environment, what are the great uh, trends that we would see and how could we actually use it to challenge our own thinking. So, um, so I wanted to, to bring you into that world um, and share our thinking. We did this first a couple of years ago, we've just uh, renewed it um, and I wanted to share what, uh, what we found out uh, about that. So the first mega trend that we established was a mega trend called more for less. This, was the, this is the uh, extraordinary trend where our population pressures are putting so much pressure on our water resources, our food resources, our mineral resources. And, uh, and this is a world where, you know, my kids are 20 and 22. By the time that they reach their retirement age, if you can imagine all of the calories that we eat every year for the whole world, and if you look at where we're standing now, by the time that my children retire, if you look at all of that that we need to produce to feed the world, it is, it is more than all we have ever produced in human history. That is the area under that graph, just in the time that my kids reach retirement, is more than we've ever done in human history. That is more wheat than ever, produ ever produced since Egyptian time. That's more fish that has ever been eaten out of the entire oceans up until now, just in the time my kids retired. That is the challenge that we face just in feeding the world that we have. And we have to do that at a time when every year about uh, an area the size of North Korea is being degraded of arable land. So we do that against some enormous uh, challenges. This is, a, uh, this is also a world where we're going to see more volatility in food prices. We knew from the previous, uh, in 2011, 2010, we saw some uh, volatility. We've just uh, seen some more recent volatility in food prices. When that happens, if you are a country unlike Australia, that is one of the 15 exporting countries of food, if you're a country that imports most of their food, um, then when that happens, we know that hundreds of millions of people go into poverty. So this is an enormous challenge for us. It's also a challenge around our water resources, something that we actually can understand in a country like Australia where we value and, and, uh, uh, and we hold our water precious. We are one of the few countries that on any given day in any given state um, in this country we trade water. Uh, we are one of the few countries that value water in nearly every transaction, uh, both when we, uh, we take it out of the tap or we use it for any purposes. We're quite unique um, in that sense. But 1.2 billion people do not have enough adequate fresh water resources right now and another 1.6 billion live in river basins and basin areas uh, that have uh, scarcity um, of water and face potential scarcity. So this is, 
this, uh, this more for less for more people is, uh, is an extraordinary trend. To give you a sense of how it impacts an organisation like us, more than 40% of everything that we do at CSIRO is directed at this trend. Um, but you wouldn't be part of an organisation that I'm part of without thinking that you could actually make a difference to some of these things. Let me just share one story. Um, one of our young French researchers, is anyone from France here? You'll be pleased with this story. One of our young French researchers was given a problem to, uh, to work on producing wheat for durum. It's actually wheat used for noodles. Um, it's really good for the farmers because they get a little bit of margin. It was not exactly the hugest value problem that we had. Um, it was going to make a couple of farmers happy in Australia and a couple of noodle eaters around the world probably happier. Um, but he came in after doing that, he was doing that and we were trying to alter the carbohydrates in the actual uh, wheat grain itself. He kept coming in to his manager and said, you really need to come and have a look at these plants. And his manager said, you know, well, look, I, look, you're working on the germ stuff, just wait till we've crushed it up. He said, no, no, you really need to come and have a look at them because they're a lot bigger. And, uh, and when he went a lot bigger, he actually meant a really lot bigger. And he, and he had stumbled on by changing the carbohydrate, um, the way it was uh, uh, created inside the grain, he had stumbled on a 20 to 30% yield increase. We now believe that that yield increase can be translated to rice and to maize. That one discovery actually could make a difference in food security around the world. Um, so that was our first uh, trend. Our second trend was called <coughs> going, <coughs> going gone. Um, and you'll see we finished this trend with a question mark and, uh, and I'll explain that question mark because it's quite um, poignant. This was really the major trend that we're seeing, the destruction at all levels from genes to species to ecosystems of our biodiversity around the world. In fact, a couple of specialists who I admire, Ehrlich and Pringle, said that for the first time in, uh, in our history, that the actions of one species, our own, will affect all of the species um, on the earth over the next hundred years and that we've never been in that situation before. Why did we finish it with a question mark? The reason we finished it with a question mark is something else was going on with this trend and that is that quietly um, there has been an increase in conservation of, of land around the world. Even in this country, in Australia, we're seeing that citizens can donate to, uh, to conservation groups small amounts of money to preserve uh, to preserve um, land around the world. That is happening all over the world. In fact, already private citizens um, have uh, contributed to protecting an area about the size of France. But we're seeing at every level, government level, national level, company level, individual level, we're seeing um, that as a species, we are intrinsically valuing uh, the, uh, the, the world around us. So we, we finished it with a question mark, um, and I think that's an important thing. The, um, the next trend uh, that we saw was called uh, the Silk uh, Highway. Um, now, who would have thought in this country that primary schools around the world would be learning to dance Gangnam Style um, and singing that song to a Korean pop star? Um, now, that's something that no one would have been able to predict, I'm sure, about 10 years ago. Um, this is really just a play on the old um, Silk Route. Um, the core of this, as the Prime Minister outlined in, uh, in her introduction, um, is this, this monumental shift of the centre of gravity uh, into our region, into the Asian region. There was an absolutely delightful piece of work done by a guy called Danny Kwa. Danny plotted, um, if you like, the centre of gravity of, of the, uh, the economy of, uh, of the world. And, uh, and, of course, early on, showing it sitting between Europe um, and the US, um, and then moving some years ago to, to sitting just above uh, the Middle East. And, uh, and of course, moving very rapidly now to in the future it will sit between India um, and China. In the world that I live in, in the world of innovation and, and R&D, let me tell you that that shift of gravity um, is already moving faster than the shift of GDP. So for the first time this year, it's all right, you can Twitter, that's, that's going to be one of the trends, so that's okay. Um, 
for the first time this year, the Asian region overtook the Americas in investment of R&D. Now, the US is still the biggest investor in R&D, but you start to put China and, and Japan and others together in this region, and, uh, and we are seeing an enormous shift of gravity. That was on the back of, and I am incredibly envious of this piece of information, that was on the back of two decades of 15% compound annual growth rate of investment in R&D in China. You can see why I'm just a little bit envious of that statistic. Um, my counterpart, by the way, in China, the Chinese Academy of Science has an annual um, budget of $30 billion, which is more than this country spends on all of innovation. I'm starting to get really jealous now. I've gone beyond envy into jealousy, which is not a good, uh, which is not a good value. So I'll move myself back. Um, what's wonderful for us is the chance to collaborate with the new, new networks, new connections in this region that don't often come from our past. And, let, and, and if there's, uh, you know, I often hear in my sphere, look, there's a lot going on in China, but if you really want quality, you know, we need to go to Germany and connect with the US. Um, let me just share with you some of the things that we are doing. Um, stem cell work in this country is, uh, is extraordinary. We, we are blessed with some very um, talented stem cell scientists uh, in, in Australia, many of them here um, in Victoria. And, uh, and of course, one of the most difficult things for anyone who's had a heart attack is that some part of the heart actually dies. And what we're working on with our Chinese colleagues is actually forming a bridge, um, a physical bridge, a little patch, if you like, that will take stem cells from an area of the heart that is uh, healthy and living quite well um, and bridge it and patch it across to another part that is healthy and, uh, and introduce stem cells into the part of the heart that was died to completely, to completely regenerate the small parts of the heart that could die, have died. That, that if we're successful with that, it's extraordinary. So just to give you a, just a snippet of some of the things that we're doing uh, with our colleagues in Asia. The next um, trend for us um, was um, around something called Forever Young. And um, uh, this, this, when you start to look at this trend, you know, there was a lot of commentary around the gap that we have in superannuation savings in this country, over 800 million uh, from where we stand today in terms of the gap for, uh, for everyone who needs to retire to have you know, adequate, uh, adequate uh, funds and, and resources for retirement. That gap, gap today is estimated at over 800 uh, million. Uh, it was also, when you looked at it superficially, gee, there's going to have to be a lot of young people, so the young people in this room having to look after the oldies in this room, and that didn't kind of feel too, uh, too good. Um, but, but then we saw something more in this, in this trend that was starting to emerge. So there were some weak signals for this trend. And that is that there's an enormous value in part of the older population that just, we just weren't tapping into. Um, just an example that we, uh, we have uh, with some of our collaborators in South Australia, we are actually going to be counting koalas using citizen science. Mobile phones have GPS. We're asking people to go out, see, spot, photograph and record the koalas that we have in a part of Australia. Um, you'd be incredibly surprised at the age diversity of people who are signing up. Um, to be able to do something as simple as that. People want to have much more flexible retirements, much more uh, um, diversity in how they retire and how they continue to contribute into the world. So it wasn't just this kind of depressing, you know, more chronic disease, which is true, you know, more obesity, which is true, um, this retirement gap, which is true, but had we really tapped into this incredible jewel um, of, uh, of our population and our older people, and we felt um, that we hadn't. I love the quote by Audrey Hepburn, um, you know, as we grow older, we discover we have two hands, one for helping ourselves and the other for helping others. I thought that was just an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary uh, quote. Now, anyone in the room over 50 who's put on Lycra recently to ride their bicycles, put your hands up, please. You probably never thought you were trending. You, you are trending. My kids will tell you, I don't trend in anything, anything at all. In fact, when I was appointed to CSIRO, my daughter had us in absolute stitches because she did an alternative 
um, uh, a small clip for the uh, for the newspaper that said CSIRO appoints fashion tragic, <laughs> and, she, and she went on to embellish this this uh, this uh, um, uh, you know pseudo article, and I and I could say we were all absolutely on the floor in stitches. Um, but I actually do trend, and so are the people who put their arms up, uh, hands up for this one, that there is a trend uh, in uh, in fitness. Um, I'm lucky enough next year I'll be going to the World Masters Games in Italy. Now, there are more athletes at the World Masters Games than there are at the Olympics. There'll be some 30,000. There's a heck of a lot less spectators. Um, <laughs> they don't do drug testing because the Colombians always turn up pissed for their races. <laughs> and sometimes we even miss them. Um, you know, they don't even check your name tag because I can remember once we were missing some fellow and we grabbed someone on the stairs and said, you're Stephen and you're doing 50 metres butterfly. <laughs> and he goes, I said, do you remember how to do that? And he says, I did it in high school. <laughs> and he jumped off the blocks looking fabulous for the first 10 metres. And you could see him in his head going, I remember this. All right. And then it's like, shit, this is hard. <laughs> and he got to about 25 metres and we're going, come on, Stephen, you can do it. It wasn't butterfly by the end of the pool, but they didn't disqualify us. So, uh, but, but that is also a trend. We're all looking to be fit. You know, we're, believe it or not, we're paying an amazing amount of money for pharmaceuticals or pseudo-pharmaceuticals or goji berries or whatever it is that we think are going to keep, uh, keep us young. And there's a whole new industry um, being dealt on that. So Forever Young is an interesting trend. The next uh, trend that, uh, that we have is virtually there. Now, we've had this trend for many years or virtually here. Um, this is when we first saw this trend. We said everything in a virtual, in the real world, will have a virtual um, equivalent. And we saw the horse today was actually part of virtually here. That everything, um, everything. And I, you know, I, so my husband said, "Oh, well, not everything." And I said, "No, no, everything." Um, so just you know, think about it. And um, <laughs> but as we've as we've discovered and evolved this, this trend, we now realise that it's more complex than when we first saw it a few, few years ago. It isn't just that we have this virtual world. There's a lot more things happening. Obviously, there's the commerce side of things in this country. Uh, we're still several percentage be points behind where the UK and the US are in terms of online uh, retail, so that is just an enormous trend. I work with several players in the banking industry. I, online trading of shares, I keep saying to the guys, I'm not sure why we want to be in this business. It is literally going to zero. Um, you know, you will be able to trade instantaneously for next to nothing. Um, and, uh, and so we're seeing these trends are really, really one way. Um, I live, for example, uh, roughly about 30 to 40 percent of my time, probably even more, uh, is in the virtual world in CSRO. So um, and, I, and I only get the game given up when my dog barks and then my team go, oh, we know where you are. Um, so, uh, you know, we li we're living more in the virtual world. But there's a few things coming out of this. We thought, do you remember the promises of this? Think back 10 years ago. And remember we were going to travel less? Do you remember that? We were going to travel less. We were going to have more time at home. We were going to be behind a screen. Do you remember all that? You know, that just did not play out. You know, we are we're actually quite human. So what's happening, the more we're in the virtual world, the more we virtually connect globally, the more we have a desire to physically connect. So we're humans. We like to touch. We like to feel. We like to connect. We, we like to be physical. So what's happened with virtual there is, is it was the opposite. We didn't travel less. We're traveling more than any other generation, any other group before us. We, uh, we're shifting jobs more. We're moving, etc. So there's a whole stack of mobility. The other thing is as we, as we purchase online and as we purchase virtually and do everything virtually, that there's a whole new structure of... Uh, infrastructure and, and if you like, back-end processing, you know, the whole packaging, etc. There's a whole new industry arriving there. So there were many trends uh, involved in this. The last one is my absolute favourite for a number of reasons. One, because I'm personally and passionately um, connected with this, and that is called Great Expectations. We almost called this the way you make me feel, thinking of Michael Jackson, but that was kind of a bit hokey. So we came back to Great Expectations. And there's two things in this. This is the this this the reason I'm excited about this trend is if is if there's anything that you take from this talk is this will impact your life um, perhaps as much as any of the other trends, but you probably don't realise it just yet. 
this is the trend where our, our, we will value experiences much more than we will value products um, in the future. If you haven't listened to Mauro Pocini um, on, on, uh, on the web, Mauro is the, uh, was the head of design for 3M and he describes this absolutely beautifully, better than I can. You know, if you've got your iPads with you, do it now and stop listening to me. Listen to Mauro. He describes the world where 3M had a wonderful pragmatic um, set of rules, if you like, for designing products. You know, they had to work, they had to function. But now, of course, sitting alongside that a completely parallel design experience for, for the actual experience of the product, which starts with thinking about, thinking about the product, thinking about going to purchase the product, seeing the product from afar, so your first interaction, what was your experience with that? Interacting with the product in the store, bringing it home with you, discovering it, unwrapping it, discovering it, see what it can do. Do you remember when, when we had to read manuals and now you don't do that, now you actually just discover your product and you, you unlock it and then even two or three weeks from when you've purchased it, you find out something that you hadn't known before. So, don't tell you. so discovering the product, interacting with your product, even finishing with it. So do I put it away in the cupboard or I'm so proud of this, I leave it on my counter for my friends to see. And perhaps I don't even put it in the bin. Perhaps then I give it to someone else to use and it doesn't go into waste. So this whole experience of the product, it wasn't just product, it was actually spaces as well. So we think about a space. Th before we go into the space, we're in the space, we're interacting with the space, we are discovering the space, we're enjoying that space and we're leaving it. So this, this trend, of course, will impact buildings, it will impact the cities, it will impact the way we design, it will impact the way we work. That work will be something that we do, not a place that we go. So we will design whole new areas of, if you like, they're not offices anymore, but they're not cafes, they'll be just alternative spaces we go to work. So this trend is absolutely huge. The other side of this trend, which is more, more really sort of explored in that, uh, in that quote there um, from Charles Dickens, is that the billions of people right now in the world that do not have access to what we have access to in, in, in our lives, that where poverty is the greatest threat to their human rights, that group of people will not be content with simply a linear progression of development or a patient progression of development or a decadal or multi-decadal progression of development. They will want a very parallel pathway that takes them not just to where we are but we're beyond where we are beyond where they currently see the best experiences in the world. And that is extraordinary. I, you know, I saw that um, played out. If you don't think this trend is going to impact you, just think of this. I was in China. I was standing on a street corner and I had next to me a Chinese uh, businessman who was on his phone. You know, look, he gave me that look like I'm doing deals while we speak. So, you know, just, just keep your distance. And, but next to him was a very young girl on a much cheaper phone and she was connecting and you go, these people probably had a thousand times separation of their salaries, they probably had you know, multiple separations in their health, uh, access to health and right then at that single point they were connecting to the same networks, that has to change the world. And so we see with great expectations, you can see why it's my, uh, one of my favourite uh, trends. Um, what are we doing about responding to this trend um, in CSRI? We've made a decision to connect with our global peers. We connect with 60,000 researchers now around the world to bring innovation to those who've been excluded from innovation because of location, because of poverty, because of their gender, um, because of barriers, because of uh, conflict. And so we now decided that, that if we work together with all of our peers from Finland, from Denmark, from Germany, uh, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, if we bring all of that creativity and innovation to bear, then we can actually bring, in, bring innovation and development to a group of people that have currently been excluded from it. Uh, it's something I'm very passionate about. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you. <laughs>